Good morning. Welcome to this video service. It's lovely that you're with us this morning. It's Sunday the 5th of July. It's slightly breezy this morning, but it's still nice outside. And we're keeping today as St. Peter's Day. Now, stay with us too, because there's some things I'd like to get involved in a kind of video conversation with you about this morning. However, the good news is that there are two other possibilities as well as this service that you can also get involved with at the moment. One, we shall be starting actual church at St Peter's at 10 o'clock today and Canon Sue Wallace will be preaching. And also secondly, that we filmed earlier this week a communion in the Keeble Chapel at St Peter's recognising that it's been a long time now since people have been able to receive communion, receive the sacrament, and that we wanted you to particularly be able to make your spiritual communion. So Ronalyn was there and read the lesson, Lucinda was there and led into sessions. But apart from that, it's a communion that will be sitting up on YouTube for some time now, actually. I don't think they take these things down, do they? Um, and you can use it for your personal devotion. I hope you will. These services will continue alongside, in tandem with, so that you can do both, we hope, the actual services in St Peter's Church and in due course in our other two churches as well. Anyway, that's the introductions. That's the notices, as it were. <laughs> Let's begin as we always do, by opening ourselves to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Remembering that we're celebrating St Peter's Day today, giving thanks for Peter and giving thanks for the community of St Peter's Church, which takes his name and follows his example. So we pray, Almighty God, who inspired your apostle, St Peter, to confess Jesus as Christ and Son of the living God. Build up your church upon this rock, that in unity and peace it may proclaim one truth and follow one Lord, your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is taken from Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this also met with the approval of among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood at guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. This is the word of the Lord. Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 to 19. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, but whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. Okay, so we've heard the readings. We've heard about Peter thrown into prison, but being brave, praying and escaping. We've heard about Peter faced with a moment of decision. Where do you stand? In whose hands are you putting your life? Who do you say that I am? Jesus said to Peter. And Peter seized the moment. He got it on this occasion. There were other moments when he lost it, after Jesus had been arrested and been beaten up before he was crucified. Peter lost it. On this occasion, he focused. Peter got it right on this occasion. You can imagine him looking Jesus in the eye in response to that question, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So what I'd like to just spend a few minutes going over with you this morning is the question, Given that we are, you might say, successors of Peter, we are also followers of Jesus. We are also those who say, yes, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. Question is a question for you and me. What does it mean in practice for us at this time to follow the example of Peter and say to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? What does it mean in practice? Forget the theory, forget all the useless hot air. Well, faced as we are with a world in pain at the moment, let's say it as it is. There's an easing of lockdown, yes, but not everywhere. Poor people of Leicester. There's a virus very much still around, isn't there? And it's going to be. And we're faced with massive grief with loads of sickness so many people have died and with collateral damage you might call it to finances every which way they've just had the bottom shot out of them finances everywhere haven't they and we're faced with much more uncertainty than we're used to now i don't want to depress you that's not the aim coming to these services but I'm grounding our reflections because we don't want to be so heavenly minded we're no earthly good and nor did Peter he was a very down to earth guy so I reckon that confessing Jesus as Christ and trying to follow him means three practical reactions maybe others as well of course you can probably work out better things but Definitely for me, I'd like to share these three with you, if I may. First, recognising all the pain, destruction and uncertainties that are around us, not trying to duck that, I reckon active discipleship of Jesus means asking the question, who is at special risk? It's clear that we all are to a greater or lesser extent. It's clear that those over 70 are, but who is at special risk? That's a question I believe that Jesus wants us to ask. Let's be clear, of course, that minority groups and vulnerable people will always suffer worst. So 
let's stop talking in generalities. Who are they in our local society? I leave that question with you. Secondly, second question, to ask ourselves, what can we do to help? Again, let's also take it as given, may we, that we are strongest never just when we go off and do our own thing by ourselves, but always in partnerships and working for that elusive but highly desirable end, the common good. That which is good for everybody. So, with whom might we partner? To work for the common good and to work particularly to help those who are most at risk. If I may, I'll leave you with that question as well. Thirdly, asking, because these are very practical things, asking to do what? What specific actions must I and we take? It's easy, in a sense. You could do this as well as I could, probably better. Identify small, achievable actions that will make a difference for good to at least one person. And write down, I find it useful to write it down, the step by step way forward, one step at a time. And if it messes up or if you mess up or things go wrong, well you adapt, don't you? You will need to pause every so often. We will, won't we? It's better for us to do it as we rather than just me or just you. We will need to pause every so often to listen to each other. Not as easy to do as it is to speak about. Most particularly, we will need to pause, won't we, to listen to those vulnerable folk I've just been speaking about and whom we're trying to help. And we, we, we will need to be amending those practical steps that we put down on paper or wrote down digitally in the light of how you are told it feels to be on the receiving end of our well-intentioned kindness. And there's another very specific practical action in response to a world in pain and uncertainty, and that is waiting. Mm. Waiting. And I reckon, although you might feel as I do that the two are opposites, they are, I think, on the one hand, but they can sit alongside each other. Waiting needs to sit alongside these immediate practical actions and I reckon it needn't disturb them unless you've got into doing things that preempt the shape of the future big picture too early on. So let's not do that. Let's resist the temptation and it's always there I think to try and get it all sewn up just one way without a lot of consultation. I reckon we need to consciously wait. Now, don't get me wrong, I really do know that that's not so easy. I don't find it at all easy to wait. But I do think it's what's needed. Waiting, listening, and slowly, bit by bit, so sussing out where the common good lies and how to get there. Just the next few steps, that'll do. There is no substitute, I reckon, when you're trying to go there together with people and you're trying to go there out of a difficult experience. And you might use that description for this lockdown. There is no substitute for what you might call hanging in there, being there together. No substitute for that at the moment. And you've doubtless noticed, as I have, that people process things at different speeds and in different ways. And they suss things 
on the hoof. As they process grief, change, fear and uncertainty. All those things that we wouldn't have asked for, but we're living with an overdose of them at the moment. So, slowly, slowly, but much more slowly than we would wish, I'm afraid, different bits of wisdom will emerge, I believe. That's the record that God's people have found. You can find it in the Bible, that if you wait, wisdom emerges. Be attentive, might I suggest. Be attentive, if you will, because I think it's worth it, be attentive to each other's feelings and to half-formed, partly there, partly not, intuitions. Don't rush the process. It's worth waiting. It's worth giving it the chance to form and then to reform, because that's what happens, isn't it? Things form, they change without hassle. Give it the chance. And let's not be afraid of grief. Because I think people are a bit, and my experience is there's no need to be, actually. It's part of life. And grief takes time. And it saps energy. Makes you a bit tireder, more lethargic. The tiggers don't bounce so much. There is no one pattern for grief. Many folk, there's been quite a lot of research done, and it shows that many folk have a natural resilience, which kicks in. But it also, we also know that there's quite often some denial of the things we've lost, perhaps some anger at the, about the loss before we then begin to adjust. And those things apply to societies as well as to each of us as individuals. Grief is part of learning to love. And you know, I reckon there's no more important lesson in life than learning to love. It takes a lifetime, perhaps more, for each of us to learn to love and to accept as well as give love and to feel grief when we mess up or others hurt us or when we have to let go of those whom we love as we do many times throughout life. Now these are the paths down which grief takes us. You're probably as familiar with them as I am. St Peter was as well. He knew about grief. But as I was saying a few minutes ago, Peter messed up big time. Do you remember the story of how he jumped out of the boat? He was so, an so anxious, so keen to get to Jesus and he sank. But that was one of his lesser things. The things he, the thing he would have been most ashamed of was how before Jesus died, how he denied him. Peter had left himself ashamed and kind of self-humiliated. We, like Peter, whom we remember and give thanks for today, know that the Jesus we follow is the one who at the beginning of his ministry shocked the religious people in the synagogue in Capernaum by quoting at them words of the prophet Isaiah and applying them to himself. They weren't expecting that, because he was a local lad, you remember. Do you remember those words from Isaiah that he quoted? The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, he said, for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives and to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favour. That is why 
faced as we are with a world in pain, in grief, and with more uncertainty than we quite know what to do with. That is why, in this situation, if we are to be followers of Jesus, as Peter confessed him the Christ, we have questions before us, I suggest to you, which I've just outlined, and those questions are about a mixture of practical actions, which Peter the practical fisherman would have wanted to get involved with doing something about who is at risk, what can we do, what are the first steps. There are questions before us about a mixture of practical actions and waiting. Waiting. And let's be honest, no point in being other is there, that in both areas, the practical areas and the waiting, we shall, I'm sorry, inevitably get it wrong at times. Sometimes badly wrong, sometimes big time mess up wrong, as Peter did. So we need to feel and feel the grief of sorrow. And the other side of it is true also, we need to feel and cherish the joy of forgiveness. Do you remember? In the story of Peter, it didn't end with the denial before Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus showed after his resurrection on the shore of the Sea of Galilee that his love was stronger than Peter's denial, than Peter's big mess up. So it is for us. Peter's is a story of hope. Not hope in ourselves, not hope in our capacity, if only we would just believe in ourselves, to sort everything. Us as wonder people? No, forget it, not that. No, Peter's is a story of hope in the love of God. That's what Peter found hope was about, ultimately, after he tripped up, fallen flat on his face various times round, he found that it was the forgiving love of God which gave him hope. Suffering with us, God does in Jesus, forgiving us, cherishing us, that's what God's hope is about, the hope that we find in God knowing that we have hope because we are held eternally in his arms of love. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. We pray for the people of Leicester and all who are still in lockdown or shielding regarding the COVID-19 virus. We thank you for all who care for the sick and pray for the safety of those returning to work again this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless our Queen and her family. May our government be guided to make wise decisions to help the people and economy for our nation. We thank you for the spiritual guidance of our bishops, for those who preach in St. Peter's, especially our rector, Dr. Ian Terry. We give thanks also for our wardens, sidesmen, and all who help in our churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, help us all to be good neighbors and to be responsible in our actions to prevent the spread of the virus by taking heed of recommended precautions and avoiding situations which could be harmful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the parish of Bournemouth Town Centre, we pray for people with other illnesses and ask you to pour your love upon them. We name Carol Fiddler, Elizabeth Bennett, Isabel Bell, Isabel Crosby, 
Margaret Shillibeer, Matthew Sims, Rosemary Miles, Susan Haynes, Val Spence and Van Jill Gorodjou from St Peter's. Bunty Ross, Jane Delahunty, Sheila Sturgis and Arthur Rowland from St Peter's. Fiona Davis, Kimberly Page and Vinnie Cope from St Augustine's, as well as anyone known personally to us. We think of Ken and Debbie Mantock, who are mourning the loss of Ken's mother, Joyce Mantock. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we celebrate today with love the gift of our church, St Peter's. May we continue to thrive and welcome all who come to worship here and that the generosity of donations help to make St Peter's Day a safe and beautiful church in which to attend. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's really great that you've been worshipping with us today. We hope you'll continue worshipping with us because, as I say, although there are actual services in church, and that is great, this video service is also really important to us, and it continues. So, I'm going to draw us together by inviting you to join with me in asking God's blessing on us using the words of the blessing for St Peter's Day. God give you grace to follow Peter and all the saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God the Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, remain with you on this St Peter's Day and forevermore. Amen.